I think we're going to have to kick off the link. Yeah, but there's a chaotic sound at the background. Right, everybody, good morning and welcome here, all of those who have joined us for breakfast. We've had a good discussion already, warming up, making Ian nice and uh, nervous about this. Ian was born in 1950, went to school in the UK, attended BITS, graduated BSc in Zoology and Botany in 1972. Took him a couple of years to do it. No, it did it immediately. Career in industrial financing with First Bank and also in Group in Java. He then joined a small financial consulting business in 1992 as a partner. And they were after he moved to Cape Town in 2002 to start a training business. He has now retired since 2018. Then he moved to Hermanus. He's interested in evolutionary biology and the intersection with geology. Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good morning and thank you for coming. I've been subject of the talk this morning is Oladina and the Origins of Life. How do I? Sorry, first technical glitch. Based on a book called The Bite in Question by a University College of London biochemist by the name of Dr. Nick Leyland. Um, I claim no originality. Um, I claim. Um, Sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can claim a certain degree of scientific literacy and uh, an enthusiasm for the subject, and I hope you find this particular subject as interesting as I do. What we're going to examine is the possibility that life originated in deep ocean alkaline hydrothermal vents, the consequence of the chemical reaction between seawater and olivine, something as mundane as water and rock. As the, as the origin of, of life. Now, the uh, eminent biochemist, Professor Steve Jones, who is a geneticist at the same university as Nick Lane, is quoted as saying biochemistry is not a suitable subject for talks to non specialists. I'm not a biochemist, you're not specialist, just ignore that and I'm just going to leap in. Life is difficult to define. You'll find no two biologists can actually agree on the exact definition of life. And if you look at something like a, a, a virus or a spore, um, they exhibit no metabolism and yet at some stage they come to life. Whilst it's difficult to define life exactly, it's not too difficult to define what life needs at its most basic level, at the level of a bacteria. It needs a continuous supply of reactive carbon. We're all built out of carbon molecules. We need a constant supply of carbon. It has to be reactive carbon. We need free energy to drive metabolism. And life basically works in the second law of thermodynamics where we are very low in entropy um, and it needs energy to drive organization. By catalysts to accelerate and channel metabolism. Um, at a natural pace, organic reactions are, are quite slow and they have a nasty habit of going in different directions. So life needs catalysts to both channel, brew, and speed them up. You need waste removal to drive reactions in the right direction. And perhaps the best example of that, which would appeal to Henny, is that in the fermentation of sugar by yeast to produce wine, um, you can't achieve a greater concentration than I believe around 15% of alcohol by volume, because as the alcohol volume increases, the rate of reaction slows down until that waste product actually kills the organism 
that is producing it. You need a differentiation between the inside and the outside. All life is contained within an inner membrane within which it organizes itself. And of course, you need hereditary material in the form of DNA and or RNA. A life uses energy on a huge scale. I don't think we really appreciate it. Um, life is more of a, a rocket than a candle. The currency of energy in the cell is a molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate, but that's not really important. It is an energy contained within the bond between the third phosphate radical and the adenosine that drives metabolism. Ishirisha Kola, the thing that gives us upset stomachs, uses approximately 50 billion ATP molecules in order to divide. A typical eukaryotic cell, we carry it, um, life form that uses oxygen, uses approximately 10 million molecules of ATP per second. Now, I'm not sure that this gentleman is a typical human being, but even so, he will use approximately his own body weight of ATP per day except that we only contain about 60 grams of this particular molecule. And what happens is that it is used, recharged, used, recharged. And essentially, as we've said, the, when the bond between uh, ATP and the third phosphate radical is broken, the energy released drives metabolism, and then the energy that replaces that molecule that is in diapole state is the energy of respiration. So respiration is basically used to attach the phosphate radical to adenosine. And that reaction, that um, respiratory reaction is a redox reaction, uh, a reaction, a chemical reaction in which electrons are transferred from one molecule to another. The electrical potential across the cell membrane in your body is approximately 100 to 150 to 200 millivolts. The membrane itself is six billionths of a meter thick. And if you scale that up, and I have to take somebody else's word for this, that's equivalent to 30 million volts per meter, which is a lightning bolt. That's how much energy we use. So energy, the, the focus of biology since, well, I was three years old when Watson and Crick unveiled the DNA molecule in 1953. And since then, a lot of focus, most focus in biological molecular biology research has been focused on heredity um, to the exclusion of the energy component of life. That's how much energy we use. It's really, really important. So the question, the question we can pose is why, with any number of other sources available, does light use this redox chemistry, the transfer of electrons from one molecule or atom to another, and the proton gradient, why a proton gradient, as the only evolved source of metabolic energy? That's it. From, from the most primitive bacteria to homo sapiens, we all use the same system. The transfer of electrons to drive the creation of a proton gradient across a semi-permeable membrane. A proton gradient. Uh, the other thing to note is that genes that control respiration are found virtually unchanged across life. So the same genes that control respiration in a bacterium control respiration in which would indicate that 
this uh, this this form of energy is sits at the very beginning, the very basis of life. And the incredible thing is that the answer to that question may lie in something as mundane as the reaction of seawater with rock. Now, I'm afraid we're going to have to do some biochemistry before we get to the geology, but I've tried to keep it as simple as possible. A, because you're not biochemists, and B, because I'm not one either. So in, in seeking the origins of life, we need to explain why all life amongst all the potential sources available uses redox chemistry and proton gradients. Now, I'm afraid this is busy. I just need to work you through. It's still membrane. In this case, this will be the membrane of the mitochondria that sit inside your cells where the respiratory reactions take place. The, could also be a bacterium. What happens here is that the electrons transferred during an oxidation of carbohydrate by oxygen are transferred down the chain of respiratory enzymes. There are four of them. And each one sits at a slightly lower level of energy than the next. So instead of the energy being transferred in one step, which would destroy the cell because it's too large, there are four steps, each one at a slightly lower level of energy. Every time the electron passes through one of those respiratory enzymes, it pumps a proton across the membrane. That creates proton concentration on one side of the membrane compared to the other side. And that, of course, creates a, a what do you call it, the electricity potential difference. Now, if it's an electron gradient, it will be known as electricity, it's proton gradient, so I get quite a proton. Sorry, Ian, can you use your cursor here, please? Yes, yeah, sure. The, the, the audience can't hear you. Oh. So what was that? Use your cursor here, yeah, they'll see it on there. Oh, okay. And people will hear you on, on Zoom. Right. Um, so we've created a proton gradient. Then what happens is that you've got this molecule of ATP synthase. It's a very complex protein that sits embedded in the, in the, in the membrane. And it's literally a piece of nano machine. It opens and closes in, in response to changes in charge. So you can see on the left-hand side, um, is like an arm that swings in response to the approach of a positive positive hydrogen ion or proton. Uh, a gap opens in the molecule. Proton moves into the into that gap, changes the charge within the within the molecule, which causes the thing to swing again and close, and the proton moves through the through the membrane. That. The energy thus released in the transfer of the hydrogen ion across that membrane is then used to reconnect that third phosphate molecule to adenosine diphosphate to reform adenosine triphosphate. Now, what, what we need to keep in mind is in the transfer of electrons through respiratory enzymes to create a proton gradient as the basic form of energy, because that is where the connect is with the geochemistry. Now we get to the geology bit. Sitting on the bed of the ocean, not on the mid-ocean mid ridges, but approximately 10 kilometers away from the mid-ocean ridges, you get alkaline hydrothermal vents. The more, the more famous cousins are known as black smokers. Um, they're far more dramatic because the, the minerals that well up from superheated volcanic, volcanically heated water 
precipitate when they hit the cold ocean water and, and generate this cloud of black, what looks like smoke. These are not acidic as our black smokers, they are healthy. They're not volcanic, they're far more stable. Black smokers apparently last in decays, these things last in millennia. They reach heights of up to 60 meters. The other thing to note is that the walls of the structure are porous. They consist of a whole load of micro pores and micro channels, which is, is going to be important. And we have, to, we have to look at the potential of these structures in the Archean seas when life first originated, when, as far as we can tell, there were far higher levels of carbon dioxide. The seawater was probably slightly acidic, as opposed to today when it's slightly basic. It would have contained, because there was no oxygen around in those days, it was before they or the invention of photosynthesis, that there would have been iron dissolved in seawater. And the other thing to note is that the structure of these vents is essentially the same as a flow reactor that's used in chemical engineering to mix, mix chemicals uh, and speed up reactions. There was also moving through the vent warm water, which I'll explain in a moment, which um, has the property of concentrating organic chemicals. It's a process known as thermophoresis. I don't know that anybody knows why it does it, but it does it. Okay, so we've got these hydrothermal vents sitting on the ocean floor. So you've got cold water, cold oceanic water, percolating down under huge pressure of several kilometers of water through the, through the seabed into the mantle rock, which contains olivine. And I believe also the same, a very similar reaction takes place with pyroxy. The olivine and the water react. It's, it's a reaction that takes place spontaneously, so it releases heat in terms of the second law of thermodynamics. So you basically, seawater plus olivine produces the mineral serpentine plus hydrogen gas plus methane plus heat. The warm water is now more buoyant than the cold, cold ocean water, so it rises. As it rises, it's full of dissolved alkaline metal, which precipitates out when it hits the cold ocean water, forming the vent and the microporous structure. So moving through this structure, you've got this warm alkaline water, and you've got the cold water, cold ocean water moving through it as well. Basically, these alkaline hydrothermal vents bring together carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas under flow reactor conditions. So hydrogen gas plus carbon dioxide dissolved in the water would form H, HCOOH, which is a, an organic, the basis, basic organic molecule. Um, it's known as formate. From formate, formaldehyde is formed and from formaldehyde, bacteria can form, can basically use that as the basis for their metabolism. The problem is that these two molecules won't react. They don't react under huge pressure. They don't react under high temperatures. They don't react under high temperatures and huge pressures. It's been tried, it's driven by a chemist crazy. It can't be done, except that methanogen bacteria do exactly that. They take hydrogen gas, and form formate. 
from which they synthesize the metabolites. Now, this is where it gets a bit tricky for me. Methanogens do this by separating the electron. All right, let me explain why the reaction won't work. It won't work because in order to create the conditions for it to work, you need a surfeit of electro free electrons. As soon as the trouble with having that surfeit of free electrons is that as soon as the hydrogen molecule, hydrogen gas, breaks down into hydrogen ions, the electrons recombine with the hydrogen ion to form hydrogen gas. That's why it won't work. What methanogens do is that they separate the electron transfers across a membrane, which has a, which has a proton gradient across it. Again, my apologies, this, is com this looks more complicated than it possibly is. So you've got within this alkaline vent thin mineral walls, which are semi-permeable, and thus mimic a semi-permeable cell membrane. Embedded in the walls of those, those wall, in the walls of those thin mineral walls, oh, I'm tripping over myself, embedded in those thin mineral walls are iron sulfide clusters. Iron sulfide clusters form the basis of respiratory enzymes. They're the active ingredient in all four of those respiratory enzymes. So it is, it is highly likely that at some stage within this vent, you've got on either side of one of these mineral barriers, flow of Alkaline warm water on one side and cold acidic water on the other. Acidic because it's got a high under our pan conditions, a high CO2 content. What would then theoretically, what is then theoretically possible is that the formation of oil can take place because, like the methanogen bacteria, the transfer of electrons become separated by the mineral barrier. The electrons move into the iron sulfide clusters because they're slightly conducted. In a nutshell, what happens within these hydrothermal vents mimics what happens within methanogen bacteria. Now, the question then is that's the theory. Does it happen in practice? Well, apparently, yes. Um, that's the apparatus, which mimics the conditions within those things. And they have produced formate formaldehyde, and most notably, both ribose and deoxyribose, which are the foundations of hereditary material. So to recap, we have within these alkaline thermal vents, we have the basics of life. We have a constant supply of reactive carbon in the form of carbon dioxide. We have a supply of free energy in the form of a proton gradient across that thin mineral barrier because the alkaline water and the acidic water, the acidic water is high in hydrogen ions, the alkaline water is low in alkaline in hydrogen ions. We have the removal of waste products by the through the flow of water. As anything's formed, it's just swept off by the current of water. And we have the basics of hereditary material in the form of the two sugars that make up DNA and RNA. And all an environment in which these reactants are concentrated. So we basically have the foundations of life. How would we shape up against the alternatives? That's your black smoker, acidic volcanic vent that occurs on the mid-ocean ridges. The problem with those is that the water is superheated. 
it's at, I think, about 147 degrees centigrade. No life can exist at birth stage. You've got the famous Miller and Ure experiment that took place in the 50s, where they put what they thought was the contents of the early Earth atmosphere, methane, ammonia, water vapor, uh, into a piece of apparatus and then put an electric charge across it to mimic lightning, and out of it came organic molecules, amino acids, which are the building box of proteins. There are some objections to the conception of what the early atmosphere was like. Some people don't believe there was ammonia present. Uh, the other objection is that some bright spark calculated that in order to in order to produce those amino acids, you'd have to have four bolts of lightning per second per square kilometer of ocean. That's an awful lot of lightning. And of course, there's Darwin's Warmed Pop, which he wrote to his friend Joseph Hooker about. Um, Darwin, he wasn't too far off the mark, considering the level of knowledge in those days. I think the biggest objection to the, to the warm little pond is that I don't think there are any warm little ponds in the Archean. On the Archean, I think there was a lot of ocean and perhaps a few volcanoes, spew volcanoes sticking up out of it. And then the, the last theory is, well, out of space. We know that there are organic molecules in asteroids. It is quite possible that perhaps they arrive from outer space, but that doesn't tell us how life originated. It just told us it doesn't originate on Earth. And that is my presentation. Um, if I can answer your question, is my phone work? I don't know if you're aware of this, but I think it's 3.5 million years. In that paper, I was amazing by the cross, of evidence of life. Mm -hmm. He's not following crystals, but the precursor to the glasses. In, they've taken the samples out of the pillow lavas. Now, pillow lavas are large and extrude on an end and go into the sea in all these other shapes. And then? It's a position. Mm -hmm. uh, the micro, so you don't need more than the micro. So extremely ultra-major rocks. And we say, if they crystallize, this picture that they have, that spinitic structure, the most amazing thing is now not the Australian spinitic grass, grass. But they actually look like they look like when you look at them, they can see them, they can see them, they can see them, they cannot do that, they can place for them. They can. They're crystallizing really, really quickly. So it's a very hard rock coming to surface really quickly. And so, so you see that nice and robust quality crystals you're getting the mantle rock. Yeah, you're getting it crystallized. In other words, those are the photographs, most of them are used to be photographs. And in those, but the microbes or evidence of biological force. I do probably that paper. Quite a darn mistake. I'd love to see it. Thank you. Definitely ties into what you say. But it doesn't appear to be the matter of you evolved. Easy to see. Well, see and all of you are the critical, yeah. And the conditions to create that protocol. The photographs of this magnificent. They're absolutely different. But they haven't finished the paper. So I think you have to this stupid comment. So the earth in the inverted honey and living in the old So in other words, the first thing was my extraordinary. 
Essentially, yes. So the we, we, that would appear to be the case. I mean, there, there, we've been searching for intelligent life outside of Earth. There are those who ask if there is intelligent life on Earth, but um, we haven't found any life out there. We found, I think, I believe we found conditions where life could life as we know it could potentially exist but i mean the universe is a humongous i mean it's it's big um who knows but yes as far as we know and it's just the coming together of, of random events that created the situation it's, it, it makes for me it makes it more amazing rather than less amazing for some people it makes it less amazing I mean, it, it, it's it's almost inevitable given the size of the universe. Well, I thought the galaxies are two bits, and the galaxies are only going to be the Yeah. Um, the Earth and ocean water, mm. uh, does it contain sodium and magnesium salts? I know it contains magnesium salts. The sodium so salts. that to appear in the organization no, um, because it, it, other than, um, than precipitating out to form an event, which may or may not be relevant, um, they don't take part in the in the creation of the organic molecules. But yes, it's I think all of the correct. Yeah, it's something at the same time, which sort of extreme mm -hmm. part of the crystallizing and over the form so the movie is very rich in magnesium. Is that it's 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 Anything else? Hmm. Thank you. I'm going to keep it short. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Uh, ask the, the Zoom audience is there anybody out there who's got a question? Feel free to either ask you or ask us now. I'm going to self ask the question or put it in text if you would like Ian to answer you. Okay, I think that's that wraps it up. Thank you very, very much, everybody, for joining us. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing one of you back on Zoom, not back here, next Thursday. And then once a month, if this thing works, we'll be inviting you for a breakfast here as well. Thank you.